this message title is probably not what you were hoping for when you thought, oh, I'm going to church this morning to get built up and encouraged. We're going to get there. But today we're going to talk about what to do in the worst season of your life. What? A few people excited about that. What to do in the worst season of your life. Um, here's why I want to talk about this. I wrote this message last night and this morning. Now, some of you might go, that's what you always do. Um, sometimes, yes. Uh, but my message was actually prepared for last week, uh, but the wonderful Rob Henser stepped in when I text him. Yep. I text him at six o'clock uh, last Sunday morning, and I said, hey, what's the chance that you could do your message that's next week this morning? Uh, luckily, he was very well prepared, stepped in and said, yep, I, I'll do it. Um, and that was because I had a child who was quite unwell, and um, with Teresa leading the children's ministry, we weren't able to make that happen on that morning. So um, thank you very much, and I've heard so much good feedback, uh, Rob, from that message. And then, uh, so the message I was going to prepare last week, I, I felt this real pause and check uh, yesterday afternoon. And I was, as is my relationship with God, I was just saying, God, is, is this what you want to say to our community? What do you want to say uh, to the community tomorrow? Um, what do you want me to share? And my thoughts went back to a book that I was aware of many years ago. It came out in 2008, and for some people that's not that many years ago, but 2008 actually is like, what's that, 16 years ago now, is it? Six, I think it is, roughly. Anyway, um, and it was a book by um, Brian Zand called uh, what, what to Do on the Worst Day of Your Life. And it came in my mind, and I was thinking about it, and then last night we flicked on the television and to just see, is there anything on? And all of a sudden, I saw all the news stories about what was happening in Sydney. And straight away, as soon as I saw it, I just knew, yeah, um, I'm, I'm sensing what I think is the right thing to do. So I put that message aside, and in spite of some of what I learned from that book, I wanted to share this morning in some of my own journey, my own take on this, about what to do in the worst season of your life. Now, that sounds morbid and heavy, but I, I just want to pause for a moment and just put it like this. At some point in your life, you're going to have the worst day of your life. At some point in your life, you will go through the worst season of your life. And you will look back, and if you were writing the story or the autobiography of your life, a memoir that you might pass on to children, I'm sure there will be chapters in that book where you revisit some incredibly painful seasons of life that you had to navigate. And I know, because one of the great joys of being a pastor, and it's also an incredibly challenging part of being a pastor, is that I journey with people very often, as many of you do too, in incredibly difficult seasons of life. I've had more times than I want to acknowledge the phone call that you don't want to get from someone who calls up and they have just received the worst news of their life and they have rung out to, to cry out for help or for prayer or can you come and be with us? And immediately we change our plans and we stop and we say let's be with these, these people in this time. Well, let's stop everything and let's pray immediately. I'll never forget, I was a pastor at our church back in Sydney and I was at a family gathering and I felt my phone buzzing and I looked down and I thought, oh, that's interesting at this time to get a call from this person. Um, it went through to my voicemail and I walked outside and I had a quick listen and I knew I needed to call this person back. So I called them back. And they let me know that they had just been given a extremely serious cancer diagnosis. Um, and the news wasn't positive. Now, the good news of that person's life is that they managed to survive um, their cancer battle, uh, which we're so grateful and we, and we celebrate. But yesterday, I was reflecting back to different seasons in life as a pastor 
but then reflecting back on different seasons in my own life and with the news coming out of Sydney of the horrendous attack that took place of a mother who lost her life, of a baby who was severely injured, of many other people who have lost their lives for reasons that we don't fully understand or can comprehend. At any given moment in season of life, a tragedy can take place. And the question is not, is this going to happen to me? It's more, uh, when this happens to me, how will I respond? And we have greater or lesser degrees of pain and suffering in our life. There are some people in, it, in this world that every day of their life is suffering and pain. And there are some of us that have to live with chronic pain. And there are some of us that live with the pain and suffering of something that's taken place many years ago. And we have to live with that pain and that ache in our stomachs. I remember the day that I discovered something incredibly painful in my life. And I remember there was a moment where it felt like a movie that I was in. Where all of a sudden, the thought races through your head, oh, this can't be my life. This isn't how I imagine my life panning out. And there was a moment of calm where I'm convinced that what I'm going to share for the next few minutes the foundation of faith that was established in my life, that was passed on to me by wise guides, by my parents, by youth leaders, by teaching that I'd heard over many years, where at the time when you hear it, you're like, nah, I don't really know how relevant that is to my life because my life's pretty good. But you hear it and somehow it gets stored away in your heart and your mind and the Holy Spirit, in that moment where everything changes, brings it right to the forefront of your mind. And it's almost like a moment, like when a person experiences um, a, a physical pain and they go into shock. Maybe it's a car accident or something. And there's this system in our body that we go into shock and in a way it protects us to a certain degree. And it's almost like when the shock happened to me, I had a moment of clarity where I said out loud, I'm going to be okay. I just said it by faith. I just said, I'm going to be okay. And then it's like the wave, it was like a tidal wave just came over me of emotion. You know the kind of emotion that hijacks you and you're like, okay, any sense of being in control is now being slipped away and now I don't have control. And then I got in my car and I drove to a, um, a leader's house that I knew. I rang my best mate. He was in a church service at the time on a Saturday afternoon. He left the church service and he came and he met me at the house where I was going and I'll never forget walking into the backyard. And by this point, I'd composed myself. And I was just about to say to the person whose house I turned up to what had happened. And they saw my face and all they said was, hey. And they just put their hand around my shoulder and they said, come. And they said, just sit down. And they sat me down on a wooden seat in their backyard. And I couldn't talk. And then not that many minutes later, my best mate rocked up and walked in and he just walked over and he said nothing. He, sat, he just put his hand on my shoulder. And when I tried to explain what had happened, again, it was like the second wave. It was just letting it all out. But the fact that I had said, by God's grace and the mercy of God in the moment and the faith that had been established in my heart, I'm going to be okay. And then from that moment forwards, there were many moments where I went, Oh man, my world is changing. My life as I know it seems all different. The ministry that I had, the, the, the role that I had, everything feels different. And all the million questions started flooding in. What are people going to say? How am I going to tell my parents? How am I going to work through this? What does the future look like? You know, all that stuff just kicked in. 
And it reminds me of the story that we read about in 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel is a book in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, that tells us the story of the history of Israel and the eras of the prophets and the kings. And if you know the backstory of Israel, when they've been liberated from being slaves in Egypt and they go into their future, they wander through the desert for 40 years and we read the story of God's faithfulness to them in that difficult desert season of their life. And then they go into becoming an established nation and a people. But the people cry out and they say, we don't want to be... We don't want to be a, a nation that has no king or no leader, even though they had prophets and they had judges and God was their leader. They're like, we want to be like the other nations. We want a king. And so they, they relentlessly cry out for that. And finally, God says, all right. And they get their kings. And if you know anything about the story of the kings of Israel, it's not a great story. It's a story of tragedy. It's a story of human um, power and uh, abuses and we read about the first king of Israel, King Saul, who started off, like many, pretty decent. But quickly, the issues of his heart corrupted him and his leadership. And in this story, we read about David, who is the young David that you've heard about probably many times. He starts off, he's got an adventurous life. He's a shepherd. He, he, you know, he, he kills bears and lions protecting the sheep. And he ends up being the guy who, at 15 years of age, the prophet Samuel comes along and declares over him amongst his family the surprise of all the brothers. This one here, he's about 15 at the time, he is going to be a future king of Israel. And he anoints him. And it, which is a way of saying he's set apart. This is, this is God's purposes spoken through the prophet for David. Except that it's not a smooth entrance into the role of king. It's a hectic, violent, um, messed up journey and story. And what happens is that David ends up moving from being a shepherd boy and having then conquered Goliath the giant to end up uh, moving into the royal palace and working under King Saul. And he ends up becoming, you know, having a military position. And as a result of his, lead, his, his role, he ends up going and, you know, conquering their enemies. And obviously, this is the era of wars and battles and violence. And it's a pretty crazy part of the scriptures. And there's a lot of stuff in it that Jesus, our Savior, later tells us that way of being is no longer. The way of God and the way of the Spirit is not the way of the sword, it's the way of love. If you follow in the way of the sword, you'll die by the sword. But if you follow in the way of peace, you get peace. And Jesus invites his disciples and his followers to live in a new way. And yet these stories we have, the book of Hebrew tells us, are there to remind us of lessons of those who have gone before us of their faith and how they navigated the context and the seasons of their life. And so what happens is that David ends up having all these military victories and everyone's like, David's amazing. He's incredible. And people start to recognize, look what he can do. And Saul, who's the current king, he becomes jealous. And there's a saying that says that Saul has killed his thousands, but David, his tens of thousands. And the people begin to sing and chant this. And this really gets into the heart of Saul. And this causes Saul to be jealous and to begin to work against David. And he actually wants to kill him. He wants to get rid of him. He doesn't want any threat to his empire that he has. And so as a result, David ends up leaving the palace and taking 600 men and their families with him. And they head off into Philistine country. And they end up in a place that's called Ziklag. Anyone ever heard that name before? Sounds like it should be a brand of a, of a clothing brand, like Ziklag. Yeah, I wear Ziklag. That's, what I, that's just the weird stuff that I think about when I read stuff in the Bible. Anyway, he goes off and he lives in this place of Ziklag. Now, during this time, Saul and his enemies are trying to take Jacob out. Uh, trying to take Jacob out. Are trying to take David out. And at the same time, David and his armies are also trying to fight 
off the Philistine armies and the surrounding groups trying to protect the land that they have. It's a pretty crazy story. And this happens about 3,000 years ago. Most people think it's about 1012 BC. David's most likely 29 years of age at this point. And it's during this time that David and his men, they leave Ziklag and they head off for three days into a place called Afek. It's a three-day journey from Ziklag. And they go off and they go about their business and they're hunting and they're scouting and they're trying to work out what's happening. And then they decide to turn back And as they turn back, they begin their journey into Ziklag. And as they get to Ziklag, David begins to walk into not only the worst day of his life, but one of the worst seasons of his life. And we read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. We'll read this together. I'll read it for you, but we'll look at this on the screen. It says, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now, the Amalekites had raided the Negev, and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but they carried them off as they went on their way. He turns up, and as they enter the city of Ziklag, where they're hiding out in a sense, they discover that everything is gone. This is the time in David's life where not only is he running for his life and he's probably thinking, whatever happened to that guy Samuel, the prophet, who told me when I was 15 that I was going to be the king? This isn't working out the way I thought it was going to work out. Have you ever had one of those thoughts in your life? Like at some point in your life, you, th- you heard, you felt like God gave you a call or a promise or there was a plan for how your life was going to work. And then along the way, the plans radically changed. This is a Ziklag moment. Sociologists talk about these moments in our life as a liminal space. It's the in-between place from where we've been, but not where we long to be. It's neither our home of origin or our future. And we find ourselves in this in-between place. This is a very difficult place to be. This is a waiting place between hope and promise. And I think a lot of people in this room have been in this place before. And in the story that we read about on David's worst day, in the worst season of his life, or one off, because he has a few pretty bad ones. He ends up turning back and coming into a city where his two wives, because this was the era when they had many wives and it was all built into the economic systems of the day and the structures and the framework of thinking they had, they are gone, and his children and his men's families are gone, and the city is burnt to the ground. There is nothing left. And at this moment, his men begin to weep. In verse 4, it says, So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. I want to share just a few thoughts with you today about lessons that I've learned, about principles that have served me well by the grace of God and the Spirit of God working in my heart to help me through the seasons of life, and I've had a few so far that have been the worst times of my life. And if you haven't had one of these yet, this is almost like an advanced decision in your heart and your mind where you say, at some point in this broken world where things don't always turn out the way we want, a phone call may come, an accident could happen, My business may go down. Someone may lose their life. I may be suffering a mental health crisis. And when that moment comes, what am I going to do? 
And the first thing that I want to suggest that we should do is when we're faced with our worst season and news that we don't want is we weep and we lament. We weep and we lament. Because somehow there is this idea in some sections of faith that living by faith means ignoring our pain and our suffering and speaking positively about what's happening. An inability to be able to be real and honest about the sheer tragedy or the pain or the suffering that we find ourselves in. And the reality is it doesn't matter if it's a paper cut or a severe injury that you're facing, pain is pain, right? Like when you cut your finger, sure, a little bit of perspective compared to someone else who loses a leg or an arm, okay? But nevertheless, when we deny the reality of what it is we're facing, we do ourselves no good and we do not do any good to anyone else around about us. As a matter of fact, even for those younger or following us, we model to them an unhealthy way to live the life of faith. Living by faith doesn't mean living in denial of our true feelings. Jesus modeled this. Jesus wept. Jesus sweated blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. He asked for the cup of suffering to be taken from him. He was raw. He was honest. We have a whole book of lament called Lamentations. It's a book that those who have put together the collection of the books of Scripture have said to us, this is important that you understand the heartache, the pain, the questions, the doubt that we go through in life where we say, where are you, God? How is this possible? This isn't part of the promise. This isn't part of the life that I thought I was going to have. And then we read the Psalms, the real expressive heartache and pain that we have in these sometimes poems, sometimes journal entries of David and Solomon and so many others. It's so important that we learn to weep, that we learn to express our emotion that we learn to let it out and that we are the kind of people that when others go through this suffering, we don't try and stop them in their suffering and their weeping and say, hey, get it together. You'll be all right. It's all going to be fine. In that moment, I believe that we are wired as human beings to literally have the gift of tears and deep, raw emotion. I conducted a funeral for one of my best friend's brothers who lost his life because of the terrible addiction of drugs. And as I was getting to the last part in the funeral service, as I was saying those final words, his mum, that I had known since I was in year four and five, collapsed down in her seat and onto the ground and she let out such a deep groan of anguish and pain in that moment as she was grieving the loss of her beloved son. And in that moment, it would be easy for us because of our own pain and our own hurt to want to shut that down. But the best gift we give anyone else who's in pain and suffering is to create a space for them where we say, let it out. This is what, how God has wired us. This is a gift for us that we do this. And that is so important that we begin to do this. So number one, weep and lament your reality and your situation. The next verses go on to say that David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. So things are getting even worse. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and his daughters. The interesting thing about this passage is you wouldn't begrudge anyone in this situation who's just lost everything from being bitter, right? That that seems like a normal human response, except that it's an unhealthy response. And what happens is when we get bitter, we often want to take that bitterness and that pain and inflict it towards somebody else. And in this case, We've got David's men who are like, this isn't about bringing this to God. This isn't about pouring out emotion just to one another. This is about in, in bringing that towards somebody else. 
And David has to make a choice in this moment. Is he going to follow in this same pathway? Is he going to be bitter? And this is why the second thought is, as Proverbs chapter 4 reminds us, it's so important that we guard our hearts from bitterness. That in a moment of pain or suffering, we've made an advanced decision where we say, my trust is in you, God. I want to guard my heart from anything that will destroy me, that will destroy my chance of restoration, of healing. Because there are plenty of people that when they go through the most difficult day or season of their life, they allow bitterness into their hearts that eats away at them for the rest of their lives. And again, I have mercy and compassion for any person that goes on that journey. But the gift that God wants to give to us is a gift in which we are tender with our hearts. We are compassionate and kind and we do not allow our hearts to be filled with bitterness. We will allow our hearts to go through the pain and the suffering that is and invite God by His Spirit and the love of community around about us to support us so that we can go on a healing journey ahead of us. So let's guard our hearts from bitterness is the second thought here. It goes on and says in verse 6, But David strengthened himself in the Lord our God. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. This is a really interesting verse that's been spoken about many times. And as a kid, I heard this verse preached in the church I grew up in. And this is a, a default position for David because David was someone who grew up playing the harp and worshipping and expressing his emotion to God. All of a sudden, we see the poet coming out here. We see the, the heart of this young man who's learnt what it means to trust in the Lord his God. And in this moment, he trusts God. There are other moments in his life where he doesn't trust God and he makes foolish, evil decisions. But in this moment, David acts in wisdom and it says he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. This was his response to a situation of massive loss and pain. The third thought for us is that we need to strengthen ourselves. And in our faith context, I mean this in the Lord. It's very hard to have joy in tragedy, which is why I think the scripture is clear when it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's not our own joy. This is a miraculous thing. This is something extraordinary that takes place when we have nothing and we are empty and we decide, I have nothing, no resources, so I will position myself, I will posture myself in such a way that I will gain strength from being in the Lord's presence. This is the gift that my family and my church gave me as a young person growing up. The gift of being able to play guitar and enough chords, enough that I could sit in my room in these worst seasons of my life, not sure how the future was gonna unfold. And I would sing old choruses from when I was a kid that declared things like, you are my rock, you're my foundation. And while everything in my physical being was saying, I can't see how this is gonna work out and it feels like everything's going bad, I put my hope in the Lord. And in spending those times worshiping God, and for you it may be going for a walk along the beach. I know very often when Teresa's been having a hard time around something, and then she'll send me these like amazing text messages or she'll leave a message on my phone. And I'm like, what? I thought you were having a bad day. And I'll say to her in a text back, have you been praying? Have you been worshiping? You know, and it's a bit of a joke between us now. Because every time when she takes this time out, to strengthen herself in the Lord, she gets fresh perspective. She gets hope. And I've discovered that in my own life too, and it's an incredible gift that we have. And this is what it means to magnify God. We, we, we talk about this, um, the scriptures in the Psalms say, magnify the Lord your God. Well, it's not that we can make God any bigger than what God is. It's just that our perspective on who God is changes. And in a moment where it feels like God is small and distant, our worship and our coming to God changes our view of the majesty and the goodness of who God is and what an incredible gift that is. So my encouragement is, on your worst day and the worst season of your life, strengthen yourselves in the Lord. 
Psalm 34 verse 17 and 18 says, The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The next part of 1 Samuel 30 says, Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. How many people have got an ephod at their house? Can I just get a show of hands? Okay, David says to the priest, bring me the ephod. What on earth is an ephod? An ephod is a priestly garment. And Abiathar brought it to him and David inquired of the Lord. Now what's interesting to note here is David literally changes his clothing. He puts down his weapons. He puts down his armor. And he changes his posture and how he brings himself before God, and then he inquires of the Lord. He seeks the wisdom of God. He says, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? This is his question. And he gets an answer back as he seeks the Lord. Pursue them. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. The fourth point is when you go through a difficult time in your life, number four, we seek wisdom on what to do next. Sometimes in the most vulnerable points of our life, It's easy for us to make foolish decisions, to quit something, to stop something, to change everything in that moment because we're vulnerable. But the most important thing we can do is to seek the wisdom and the counsel of God and as other scriptures say, to seek the wisdom of godly counsel around about us who can guide us and lead us and help us when we find ourselves in a deeply painful situation. And I think it's so important that we decide to actually sometimes lay down our current weapons and our current, even our work scenario enough to put on a different piece of clothing, this is metaphorically obviously, to say I'm going to take some time to inquire of the heartbeat of God. And then after hearing the wisdom of God to us on what we should do next, number five is we get up and we walk by faith. We get up and we walk by faith. This doesn't mean the suffering's gone. This doesn't mean the hurt's gone. This isn't like, hey, it's a happy day. I'm going to put on a little bit of The Surfaces, which is a band that all the kids are into or a bunch of kids are into. And it's it's like, it's a happy day. It's going to be an amazing day. You know, it's like, it's not some kind of like talking ourselves into something. It's being real and honest, but choosing to walk by faith, trusting God in the moment that what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk in the direction that wisdom is telling me to go. And I'm going to do it trusting God that he is with me, that he will be faithful, and that his goodness will follow me all the days of my life. And as the Psalms say in Psalm 30, verses 5 and also 11 and 12, and I want to invite the musicians to come forward if you would. It says, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. I don't think that's necessarily literal in the sense that, well, tonight I weep and tomorrow everything's going to be joyful. I think it's a seasonal idea of saying a day is coming when there will be joy once again in the morning, where the suffering and the pain that I have endured, it will be like the sun has risen again and it's a new day of hope. And finally, number six. And man, has this been so true in my own life and in so many of the lives of people that I've journeyed with. We have a redemptive view of suffering. We have a redemptive view of suffering. Victory for the Christ follower is not the absence of pain and suffering, but redemption, restoration, a new life beyond it. A resurrection day is ahead, and God uses tragedy and turns it into healing hope. I believe this from the core of my being, for my life, and for your life. Through the tragedies and the struggles and the pain that I've gone through, when you think, did you make this happen, God? My theological and philosophical position is, I don't believe that God brings of his plan and purpose, pain and suffering into our life. I think it's part of the way the world is. But I believe in a God of love who is in the moment of our pain and suffering like he was with Christ on the cross, where God did not turn his face from the sun, but actually the full fulfillment of Psalm chapter 22 
is experienced where Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which he quotes directly from Psalm 22. But if you read the rest of Psalm 22, which his followers and those who were brought up in the Jewish tradition would know so well, it declares that God never turns his face away because God is with us in our suffering. And God is the one by his love and his spirit who works in us to redeem, to restore, to heal. And the scars that we have on our hands and our feet and in our side that we carry are the reminders for us of God's faithful to us, faithfulness to us on Good Friday when we go through the journey of the cross and the day of absence on Saturday. But the hope that resurrection will be there on that Easter Sunday. And this is the pattern for every follower of Jesus. No matter what you're going through, there is hope. And God can use your pain and your suffering in a redemptive way to bless and to help others. And I have seen it time and time again of parents who have lost their children, who have walked with that pain throughout their life. But God is healing and healed them to the point where they are able to stand alongside someone else in their moment of grief and loss. People that have lost their marriages, who now know how to walk with somebody else who has or is. People who have lost everything in their business, who down the track, either because they recovered their business or God helped them start something new again, they were able to stand with others who were at their worst day when they walk back to Ziklag and they go, no, no, this can't be happening. And we come along those people and God uses us to bring hope and peace and put our hand on their shoulder and let them weep. Thanks for joining us for Online Church today. Please don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, like the video and follow us on social media. It really does mean a lot. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.